Uh, well, it's now 8.01, so I guess we'll kind of get started here. Thank you for joining me. It's, uh, it's uh, really great to, uh, to have you here just to, to talk about, uh, to about ponds and water. I, I love ponds and water, so um, we'll get started. So tonight, I'm just going to do a really brief introduction about who we are, what we do here at Clean Water Pro, and then we'll get into some of the things that you might want to think about if you're looking at uh, converting uh, an existing dugout or maybe building a, a, a dugout uh, that you're going to use for swimming. And then some of the solutions to keep it clean and keep it healthy. Um, and then we'll just touch on some of the work that uh, we've done in the past. And then at the end, I'll open it up for questions. Um, I'm more than happy to answer any questions that you might have. So, um, so I'm Lynn Melvin. I'm the owner of Clean Water Pro. I love water. I love talking about water and helping people um, remediate their bodies of water so that they can use them the way that they would like to. And um, all of our stuff is, you know, environmentally friendly. So we're uh, protecting the environment that way as well. And we're we're very excited about that. Um, so we have a commercial side to our, our business where we go out and we assess and treat ponds, but we also have a, a small storefront here in Carmen, Manitoba. Um, we have office space in the back and that's where we have our lab as well. So um, it's a busy place with both the, uh, the commercial side of things and the retail side of, of, of our business. This is uh, our uh, summer staff from last year. They were the ones that were out on the ponds. A lot of them are envir from environmental science. So they assess the bodies of water, they treat them, um, always reading and, and reacting. So they're a good group to work with. We also have installers and uh, other personnel that I just couldn't get everybody together on one day for a picture. So we're very much science driven. We look at water chemistry. We look at, you know, what's, what life is in the pond, what's, what life's around the pond, what's leave, like well, what water is draining in there, what are some of the issues. We even look at the bottom, the muck levels and things like that. So we really want to understand what's going on in each pond because every pond is unique and it's going to require different ways of, of dealing with it. Um, we have an extensive liability insurance um, to, allowing us to work with water so we know that our clients are covered, we're covered, and we're a safe work certified company which I'm super proud of. Um, that means that not only do we meet all those expectations but we go above and beyond to make sure that our staff are, are safe out when they're working out there. Okay, so if you're looking at setting up a swim pond, um, now whether it's a dugout that's maybe relatively new, then you know, then you know the history. But if it's something that's been around, you know, 20, 30, 40, even 50 years, um, you kind of want to know what it was used for and what might be in there. So first of all, like how old is it? Can you figure that out? Um, what was its former use? Was it used for irrigation? Was it used for cattle? Was it, you know, what was it used for? And what, what might be on the bottom? You know, some of those older ponds, um, they were kind of a dumping ground. Sometimes they would dump concrete in there or old vehicles or, you know, anything. It was kind of a little bit of a garbage pit. Some of them, not all of them, but some of them. So you just want to know what your pond was used for and what might be in there that could be potentially a hazard if you're swimming in there. And you're gonna to wanna to look at the water chemistry as well. E. coli is one that you need to be concerned about. Um, you don't want the levels over, I believe it's one part per million. And, um, you know, so if you have a lot of ducks in there and geese in there and things like that, or maybe you have pasture around, around the area where that, you know, um, that water draining in there could have a lot of feces and things like that, then your coli levels could go up. And so you want to be aware of what, what those levels are and, and get them tested to make sure that, you know, you or your family are not going to get sick. 
Um, LJ, you know, mo for the most part, LJ, it might cause some skin irritation. The one that I'm most concerned about is the blue-green LJ. And the reason being, um, blue-green can have toxins associated with it. And if you ingest those that water with those toxins, it could make you very sick. It could even you could even die from it. So it is something to be of concern. And um, so you need to be able to control that LJ in the water to make sure that uh, that you stay safe. Swimmer's itch, you're not going to die from it, but it sure is irritating and annoying uh, when it does happen. So. Um, and ponds do get it, and it's not, you know, is is because the waterfall comes in, um, and then they uh, they poop in your pond. Basically, the parasites come out, they get into a snail, and then they they come out of the snail, and they're looking for a goose or a duck or you know any of those water water birds that might be on there, and that's when they come into contact with you. They bite you. It irritates your skin. They die. It, it's not like they're not hurting you other than just causing a real bad reaction. Um, so you need to be able to, A, you want to try, avoid having waterfowl on your pond as much as possible, and B, you want to clean up your that secondary host, which is usually snails. So there is treatments that you can put on there to, to knock those out. And then the nutrient load, because the nutrient load is what's going to feed your aquatic growth, your algae, your aquatic weeds. So keeping that nutrient load down keeps your water, you know, um, that growth at bay. Now we want to look at the pond floor. Um, so when you have a pond that you're wanting to swim in, it's really uh, a good idea to know your depths. Um, we, we go out and we map uh, even small ponds where we have we have a, a sonar tool that we can map it. We know we can see if there's anything sticking up under there and things like that, which is a really useful tool. Um, and you just want to be aware, like especially if you got kids and things like that, you just want to know what your depths are. You also want to know the muck level. Um, a lot of those ponds, if it's not a newer pond, it's probably going to have some muck at the bottom. And that muck might only be a few inches, but it also might be a lot more. It might be a few feet. And so if you have somebody waiting in there and they're, you know, you don't want them to get stuck. And it can happen, right? Uh, we have some retention ponds that we've worked on that were 45 inches deep. And that's, that's really deep and, and it's hard to get out of that because the suction's around you. So you want to know how much muck you have down there if you're going to be, uh, if it's in an area that you might be walking in. Um, that muck level also contributes to your aquatic growth, such as your weeds that are growing in the bottom as well. And as that muck is decomposing, it's releasing nutrients into the water which increases your aquatic growth, whether it's algae or, or aquatic weeds. Um, and there's ways of measuring the muck to see how much is down there. Aquatic weeds, um, another thing that you're gonna wanna have under control if you're swimming in there, because you don't want it to wrap around anybody's legs and things like that. So there are ways of, of controlling um, the weeds and the muck, and we'll kind of talk about that in a little bit. Now, you all also want to look at your entry and, and exit of the pond. You know, how steep is that bank? Um, the, uh, you want to have, you want to be able, like if you're in the water, you need to be able to get back out again safely and easily, especially if you're not a strong swimmer. And maybe that's a matter of even putting in a dock with a ladder or uh, a lot of ponds are built where there's kind of a beach area and there's kind of a gradual entry into the pond so that you can get in because some, sometimes the ponds dugouts are dug so they have such a sharp bank it's really difficult to, to climb up it and get out of the body of water. So you wanna make sure that you have somewhere that you can get out safely and easily. Um, if 
but the, the government recommendations, if it's a community pond or a pond that's going to be a public pond, like in a campground or something like that, they recommend a one to 12 um, uh, slope where it's when it's under 1.5 meters. And then once you're between 1.5 and 2 meters, you want a one to three slope. And then after that, it can get a little bit um, sharper on, on that slope. But that's what uh, the uh, provincial recommendations are for a public pond. Pond safety, you know, you know, typical stuff. You, um, it's wise to have a first aid kit nearby. Um, also a cell phone, if you need to phone for help that you have access to that quite readily. You may also wanna have a reaching pole uh, so that you can reach, reach out and uh, save somebody or you have a, a device that you can throw out with a rope on it so that, you know, if somebody gets into trouble that they, they can latch onto that and, and hopefully you can pull them to safety. Um, it's always good to have have a few things on hand just to make sure that uh, you know something something happens that you're ready for it and you can keep everybody safe. Uh, oops, put my mouse the wrong way. So, how is your dugout used at this point in time? Do you use it, you know, for recreation like fishing or maybe paddling around? Maybe you use it for irrigation or uh, do you have cattle that maybe drink from it, whether they drink right from it or if you pump the water to them? Um, you know, lots of people have dugouts that they use of the water in their houses as well for flushing toilets and showering and things like that as well. So some of the typical issues that we see, um, submerged weeds. Now, I mentioned before that's something that you wouldn't want to be swimming in. So getting a handle on those would be a, a good thing. And that's typically a result of having a, a muck accumulation on the bottom. So if we can get rid of the muck, we can usually get rid of the submerged weeds. Um, duckweed is, it is often confused as algae. It looks like algae from a distance until I get real close to it. And you can see that it's actually a teeny tiny little leaf that grows on the surface of the water. And it seems like overnight it can take over the entire pond, just turn it green. Um, it's irritating to, to work with and it's very difficult to get it under control, but it, it is possible. It just takes a lot of time and effort to, to do so. Nutrient uh, loads, so looking at that water chemistry, how much, you know, what, what's your ammonia, your nitrates, your phosphorus in the water. Um, so, you know, that we want to look at. And then, of course, your algae. So let's, uh, let's touch on algae. There's different types of algae out there. Um, some will irritate your skin, some won't bother you, but some do have those toxins in them. Algae comes in all different shapes, uh, uh, colors. Uh, there's so many different species out there. It's really quite fascinating how many there are and what they look like. So on the left there, you can see there's black algae uh, growing. And then on top of that, there's some string algae, that little green clump there. To the right, that's red algae. So when that pond, um, uh, when it started to bloom, the people thought somebody dumped red paint on it. It just, but it turned red, it was crazy. Um, the blue-green algae, we talked about that before, so that's the one with the, the toxins, and um, it can it has that blue blue color to it. Sometimes it's, it looks like a thick green paint that's on top of the water. String algae, um, so it kind of it's frothy and green, and if you took a stick, it would kind of stick to it and come out in large clumps. And then green algae, where it's like it, the, it's algae right through the the water column. It's very murky and and green. And algae is a, usually a result of high nutrient loads. So getting that nutrient load, getting uh, some aeration in there can help. Um, these are just some pictures of, of staff that are out and about. Um, they're looking at the, the muck in the pond. They're identifying weeds that are in the, in the body of water. They're actually in the lake in that one. Um, so that's um, part of, you know, just analyzing your body of water. 
And then again, we talked about duckweed. So uh, when you pull it up, it actually looks like a teeny tiny little leaf. So, but you know, from a distance, it's easy to confuse it with, with algae. So dissolved oxygen, aeration, that's key to improving any body of water. Just, you know, uh, water and all that, you know, when things are breaking down and all the little invertebrates or fish that are in there, they're all using oxygen. So it's important to, um, you know, when, when, when the nutrient load gets high and that muck level gets high, it's really using up all the oxygen in there and it becomes anoxic. And then it develops, a, there's a thermocline in there as well, where the gas is at the bottom, cannot penetrate through to come uh, get out and neither can the dissolved oxygen that might be entering from the top, it can't penetrate through it. Um, so it's important to make sure that you have enough dissolved oxygen in your ponds to keep it healthy. So we have um, different solutions um, that we can use to bring down those nutrients in the water, which will help to control your algae and your aquatic weeds. And uh, we do have some that will take care of some of that uh, if you do have some snails in there to knock them out as well to reduce your um, swimmer's itch. So the aeration that we were talking about, there's a couple of different kinds. There's the floating fountain, which can work if it's um, maybe a shallower body of water. Um, because I, the reason I say shallower is because you can see there, it's only drawing from you know three or four feet down and around that 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 fountain, so it's not moving the entire body of water. It's not flipping it over. It's not drawing right from the bottom, and it's not breaking up the thermocline. But if you go with a fine bubble subsurface aeration, where the plate sits on the bottom, those bubbles, the air is pushed in there, and it rises. Uh, the air rises to the top, and when it ruptures at the top, it's uh, has more dissolved oxygen that is entering the body of water and you have dissolved oxygen from top to bottom and that helps to speed up all the natural processes all the natural bacteria in the water so that they can do their job a lot faster and, and more efficiently so then you, you know your fish your vertebrates uh, are a lot healthier in in that body of water the fountains, you know, they're beautiful to look at for sure. They do move the water, they do add some aeration, but like I said, um, if it's a deeper pond, you're better to have some subsurface aeration in there for um, better results in, in, in improving that body of water. We have uh, some maintenance tools as well that you might find useful. We have a weed cutter, a razor, so when you throw it out into the pond and pull it back, it'll, it'll slice off all those weeds for you. And then you can go back in with the rake and pull them out. So the one on the, the right is the, the reed, weed razor. The one on the left is the weed rake. And the one in the center is called a muck razor. And it, essentially it's like um, an underwater tiller. So you just roll that through the bottom, through the muck. It helps to kind of just grind that all up on the bottom uh, and, and it helps to get rid of that muck. So when you put in the, um, we have pelleted form of um, beneficial bacteria that sinks into the muck and eats it. Um, so if you put that on there and then you roll that roller through, it kind of helps to mix it in and it, it, it can work really well to eliminate a lot of that muck that you have in there. And it's, it's great for your, like your beach areas and things like that. So I'll just touch on a few of our projects that we've done in the past. Um, so we put in um, aeration in, in fish in lakes that are overwintering fish. So we, we need to keep water open and keep that dissolved oxygen high. So we have um, the aeration plates that are in the in these lakes and they, they keep them open and then the fish, um, it breaks up all that, uh, the thermocline that's in there as well and keeps uh, the fish happy and healthy all winter long. 
This one here is string algae that kind of got away on that one pond and we have it cleaned up within a couple of weeks just using um, an array of uh, the beneficial bacteria uh, that we use. This one here is duckweed. Took, that one took uh, quite a while, like a year, year and a half to, to get it under control. And when we first started in there, it was solid green from end to end. These are a couple of the community ponds that we uh, that we work with. One on the left is Plum Cooley. So they use that pond. Um, they have a campground there. Uh, the public come out and, and use it all the time. It's uh, quite beautiful. And uh, the one on the right is in Reston, Manitoba. And they just built that a couple of years ago and expanded their campground. Um, believe it or not, that used to be a slough. <laughs> Uh, when they first started. So that's just a, a couple of our projects. Oh. So yeah, um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. I'm just gonna, there should be a, a chat thing here. Or if you want, I, if you wanna unmute, I can, um, I can allow you to talk to. Oops. Thank you. Sorry, technology is fun. There we go. Okay, somebody's got their hand raised. Yes. Sorry, Zoom and I, I'm not used to Zoom very much here, so I'm just uh, learning it as I go. There we go. So if you uh, if you want to type in the in the chat if you have any questions, and if you don't, that's if you need to to head out, that's fine. But I. I really want to um, thank you for joining me and I hope that you found that, that this was useful for you. And of course, it's if it's easier, you can always um, uh, email me or phone me. I'm always happy to answer any questions that you might have. Uh, what is the product that we use to get rid of snails? It's uh, We use Dissolve, Dissolve powder. Um, you kind of need a calm day and it's a powder and you just you spread it onto the pond and it sinks through and when it comes, uh, sinks to the bottom and comes into contact with those snails, it, it basically kills them on contact but it's not very toxic at all like it um, essentially when it breaks down it's like baking soda and the other one that you can use is a, a blue stone but I, I avoid using it um, just because it it really knocks out the whole balance of the pond and it's residual it stays it stays in the bottom of the pond but the the dissolve seems to work quite well uh, you may have to treat, you know, a couple of times to get them all out. We have one pond that there, oh, there's tens of thousands. It was unbelievable. There were just, and there are big ones and they're just everywhere and it knocked them out. Um, are any of the additives uh, to control the weeds harmful to the dogs? No. Um, the products that we recommend are environmentally friendly. They're already occurring. The species of bacteria are already in our environment. They're already there. So um, those products are all safe for people, fish, pets. Um, there's no, no risk that, uh, that your dogs or, or cats or any, anything's going to get sick. Any other questions? 
Okay, well, um, so I'll wrap it up, I guess. And then, yeah, if you have any any further questions, you can always um, give me a call tomorrow or send me an email or text me or whatever, and I, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. So thank you again for joining me tonight and um, have a great day. Oh, there's one more question. I have lots of trees around our pond. Is it better to cut them and let the sun on the water? Um, uh, there's pros and cons, right? Because when your leaves, when the, the, the trees drop their leaves in the fall, then all those leaves go into the pond and then they start to break down and it adds to the muck. But at the same time, those trees also offer shading, like shade for that pond as well, which is um, beneficial. It kind of keeps it cooler. So I wouldn't say that it's, um, that you have to cut them down. Uh, I would be inclined, inclined to leave them. Um, having a good riparian zone around the pond. <clears throat> so if you have a tree and then you have the riparian zones, the grasses and perennials and things like that, that'll help keep some of those, um, those leaves out of the pond as well. And in the fall, you might wanna just concentrate on um, you know, putting your muck away in there or whatever along those edges to kind of keep the, um, to help break down those leaves as, as quickly as possible. But if you have mature trees, I think they, they, they're doing more good than, than bad, really. So um, I prefer to, to leave them. Okay. So thank you guys. Um, have a wonderful evening and um, hopefully we'll talk to you soon. Take care.